Amen. Thank you for that, Brother Paul, and thank you, Music Ministry, uh, for um, the music about heaven today. Uh, you should have received this morning, if you were in the service, uh, this little pamphlet or booklet entitled Heaven, Bible Answers to Questions About Heaven. It's written by uh, Dr. Curtis Hudson, who I can remember as a boy, him preaching in this very church on some special big days that, uh, that we had done. And uh, Dr. Hudson was the editor of The Sword of the Lord before that, was a pastor of a great soul-winning church. And God used his life in a great way, went home to be with the Lord in 1995. And um, if you did not get a copy of this book this morning, um, it, it's perhaps maybe you're, you're serving in a, in a different area and uh, you just, just, no one put one in your hand. Uh, if you'll see me tonight, if you'll see Pastor tonight, or even one of our ushers, we'll do our best to get one for you. And here's what we'd like for you to do with this book. We'd like for you to read it, certainly. But we also want you to do is we want you to take it, we want you to give it to someone else, someone that you're burdened about. Um, very few people will, will refuse a book about heaven. There might be some, but very few people will. And so uh, let's use these as, as kind of a, a little bit larger of a track. It's, it's a fairly short read, maybe 25 to 30 minutes. Someone will go through it. And it answers questions about, uh, from the Bible about heaven. Uh, question number one, is heaven a real place? Number two, what kind of place is heaven? Uh, question number three, do the saved go to heaven immediately? Will we know each other in heaven? Uh, will we have a body in heaven uh, do the saved in heaven know what is happening on earth? Lots of questions with Bible answers. And so let me encourage you to pick up a copy of this booklet. And then also tonight for being in the service, uh, we are uh, giving away this booklet entitled Tears in Heaven. And this was written by Dr. John R. Rice, who also was the editor of The Sword of the Lord, the founder of The Sword of the Lord. And he went home to be with the Lord in 1980. And this book is a little bit more written towards Christians, towards saints. And maybe not necessarily something that you would give away necessarily. Uh, but uh, we, want, we want you to have this as well. Again, some, uh, some um, uh, great scripture uh, that talks about our eternal home. It talks about heaven. And uh, we want you again to get a copy of this and, uh, and take it with you. Uh, when we began to plan this day, probably more than a month or so ago, obviously we had no idea. We never know uh, what God is going to be doing. And we certainly would not have known that in the last week or so that we would have said goodbye and bid farewell to four, at least four. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking maybe even five church members. Uh, that have passed to the other side. We, we could not have begun to imagine that. that there would be folks sitting in this service tonight, in this very auditorium, in which heaven has always been real to you, but it'd be, it's so much more real tonight because you have someone there, uh, someone that you loved and someone uh, that uh, made such an impact on your life but on all of our lives. And uh, we certainly understand that God works in mysterious ways. And so I suppose maybe a, a, a day like today in which we focused on heaven, uh, maybe it's just a little bit more special it would have been special regardless, but maybe just a little bit more so. If you found your Bible, uh, I would invite you to take your Bible and go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 14, if you would. Uh, the Gospel of John chapter number 14. And when you found your place, if you're physically able to, I'd invite you to stand as we read uh, the Scripture tonight. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 1 of John chapter 14, and we'll read down through verse number 6. The Gospel of John chapter 14, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The title of the message tonight comes from verse number two. I'd simply like to preach to you this subject, on this subject, my Father's house. My Father's house. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this great host of people that are here with us tonight. Uh, Lord, to... Um, uh, to worship you, to hear from you, uh, Lord, to exhort one another and encourage one another, uh, to be strengthened and challenged and helped in their Christian life. Heaven is such a beautiful thing for those of us who know Christ as our Savior. And the thought of it is almost overwhelming. The Bible indicates that we cannot even put into words just how amazing and wonderful heaven really is. Lord, in the short amount of time that we have together tonight, I pray that you'd help me. Lord, as we consider this subject of the Father's house, 
Lord, there's, there's no reason why anyone that is standing in this auditorium at this very moment should have to miss spending eternity in the Father's house. And we pray that if there's someone here tonight that does not know for certain that heaven is their home, uh, that they would spend eternity in the Father's house, that they would give careful consideration to the message tonight. Lord, we pray for those that do know they're on their way to the Father's house, they're on their way to heaven. I pray that you'd encourage them through these few simple thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. So we come to the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, and we find that Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. In just a few short hours, Jesus Christ will hang on a cross and he will be dead. There seems to be a somber mood that has settled among Christ and, and his followers in this place. At the beginning of chapter 13, they enter in for the feast of the Passover into this upper room, and they're greeted by the Lord Jesus Christ who takes a basin and a towel, and he girds himself, and he kneels down, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet, an act of great service and humility. There just was something different about this night, and no doubt his disciples were aware that something was happening even though perhaps they were not able to grasp it all. On this night, he has tried to prepare them for what is coming, but again, they are unable to grasp what lies ahead. In chapter 13, as we mentioned a moment ago, he washes their feet. In chapter 13, he predicts Judas's betrayal, and we find Judas betraying the Lord. And even towards the end of chapter 13, warned Peter that the night will not expire before he denies him three times. In the midst of all of this, all of these things that are going on, Jesus transitions to teaching on the Father's house. Well, Jesus had no human father. He certainly was not talking about his, 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 his earthly father, or the man that was given the responsibility of kind of being the caretaker of Lord Jesus. He wasn't talking about Joseph. He was talking about his human father. Uh, we, we certainly gather that uh, by the fact that father, the word father, is capitalized here. It's speaking of a specific a person. It's speaking of God the Father. And so it's important to note that he is, again, speaking of God the Father. When he says, my Father's house, uh, we obviously understand that he is speaking of a place called heaven. That he would reference heaven during a time such as this is important to note. I want you to understand that life is a journey. And every journey that you and I take in life, it has, has a destination. We're, we're going somewhere and I believe from God's perspective, the journey of life is intended to end at the destination of heaven or the Father's house for every single one of us. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. In other words, God doesn't want or God has not predestined anyone to die and go to hell. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to wash away the sins of every single man, every single woman, every single boy and girl who is living now, has ever lived, or will ever live in the future. His blood is sufficient. The journey of life is not about you accumulating wealth and, and living in a huge house and driving the nicest cars and shopping at the finest stores. No, no. The journey of life is about you and I being introduced to the Word of God that tells us about how we can know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and about us making a reservation in the Father's house. That's what life is all about. That's God's, that's God's perspective. That's life from His perspective. As we consider the timing of Christ's teaching and the place of Christ's teaching here in John 14 and who He was speaking to, we can learn some things about the Father's house or about heaven from this passage of Scripture. Number one, let me share with you, the Father's house produces comfort in troubled hearts. The Father's house produces comfort in troubled hearts. Notice verse number one. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus says. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. The hearts of the disciples were filled with trouble. They're filled with worry and fear on this particular night. According to John chapter 16, I want you to turn your Bibles with me very quickly to John chapter 16. Look in verse number 6 if you would. Jesus again is speaking on this same night. He's still in the upper room. He says in verse number 6, But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. 
Look with me in John chapter 16 and look in verse number 22. Jesus again is speaking still in the upper room. And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice in your joy. No man taketh from you. Now, Jesus is speaking about a future event here, but he says on this night, in this room, what would characterize the hearts of the disciples, he says, is sorrow. There's grief, there's, there's worry, there's fear, there's trouble. And so Jesus introduces the subject of the Father's house for the intended purpose that it might produce comfort in troubled hearts. How do you encourage yourself when you're down and when you're discouraged and when you're frustrated and maybe even dealing with bouts of depression? What do you do? I submit to you tonight, based on the example of the Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples in John chapter 14, the next time that you or I start to feel discouraged and start to feel down and start to get a little depressed, I, I propose to you that perhaps we set our sights on the Father's house. I propose to you that we take a step back from the cares and the troubles and the anxiety and the anxiousness of this world and we set our sights on a place called heaven. That's the example that Jesus Christ gives to his disciples. We ask the question, well, why were their hearts troubled? What was bothering them? First of all, we consider they were bothered by the betrayal of Judas. Jesus had instructed them that someone was going to betray him that night. Immediately as they sat around the table breaking bread, they asked among themselves, is it I? Is it you? Is it him? I kind of get the sense that they would have all suspected that they would have been guilty of this before Judas. There was, there was, some, there was something about Judas that they, I, I don't believe they ever thought that he would be capable of doing something like this. You say, well, how do, you, how do you know that they felt that strongly about him? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, Judas was the one who kept the money. He was the, he was the financial guy in the group. You can imagine that you'd have to have some strong trust in a man that was going to carry your money around, that was going to be responsible for paying the bills. He would be the last person that you would assume would betray and would let you down. You would never employ him in such of a position. You would never place him in such a role if you didn't think that he was trustworthy. And so they asked among themselves, is it, is it John? Is it James? Is it Peter? Is it Andrew? Bartholomew? Who is it who might betray him but doesn't seem like the name Judas would come up? We, we give further evidence of this because Jesus Christ was very clear. Notice in verse number 25, he then lying on Jesus' breast, again we're in John 13, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Who's the betrayer? Verse 26, Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the stop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now look at verse 28. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Verse 28, 29. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the stop, went immediately out, and it was night. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus didn't beat around the bush. Jesus was very plain. The one that I dipped the sop with, and when he dipped the sop with Judas, he looked at Judas and says, that thou doest do quickly. And he got up and he left. Jesus had just told them, here's the man. And yet in their hearts, they thought, well, I wonder why Judas left. Maybe, maybe Judas is going out to buy some things that we have need of here for the feast. Let me look around. Maybe we're, maybe we're running low on, on some of this or some of that. Or, or perhaps maybe, maybe Judas has gone out to give some of our finances to the poor to be a blessing to someone tonight. I mean, it completely went over their heads. No doubt when it finally sunk in, wait a minute, Judas is the betrayer? The one that we trusted with our money? The last person that we would think would be guilty of betraying the Lord Jesus Christ is the one it is? Oh, I have to think that that produced trouble in their hearts. But notice, secondly, 
not only the betrayal of Judas, but the, the announcement of Jesus. Look at me in John 13 and 33. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, look at verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. He was leaving them to go to a place that they could not go at this point in time. Their leader, their master, their teacher was announcing his departure. They couldn't imagine life without his physical presence being there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have said goodbye to a loved one. You've buried them. You've gone to a cemetery. You've stood at a casket at a funeral home. You can't imagine life without that person and that individual, but life must go on. That produces trouble in our hearts, doesn't it? It produces worry and fear and discouragement. How in the world am I going to pick up the pieces? How am I going to move on without this person in my life? The announcement of Jesus produced trouble in their hearts. Notice, thirdly, the failure of Peter produced trouble in their hearts. Verse number 38 Actually, look at verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Judas had betrayed him. The last person that they would have thought would be guilty of such an act. And now Jesus is predicting and prophesying that Peter, the more or less the vocal leader of the group is going to deny him? I mean, you, you would imagine the, the worry and the fear that is filling their hearts. This doesn't seem possible. Perhaps the two disciples that everyone felt the most confidence in uh, were, were, were set to falter. If these two, if these two, if Judas and Peter were going to be guilty of these things, then what might these other men end up being guilty of by the time the night is out? Jesus looks around the room and he senses troubled hearts. And what does he do? He immediately brings up the topic of heaven. Again, I submit to you that when you're in need of encouragement, when you're in need of a smile, when you're in need of a peaceful thought, think about heaven. The other side. You say, well, why, why, would, I, why would I think about heaven? What's so special about heaven? I share with you, I think, there's three reasons why heaven brings us such hope. Number one, because of who is there. Heaven's a special place because of who is there. First and foremost, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit reside in the heavens. Oh, what a thought. That we someday will behold our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. We will look on him who has the pierced side. We will see the one with nail prints in his hands and in his feet. We will behold our Savior. Oh, what a glorious thought. Heaven is a glorious place because of who is there, God the Father and God the Son. But in addition to God being in heaven, notice not only is God in heaven and that makes it special, but how about our loved ones who died with their faith, placed firmly in Jesus Christ who have gone on before us. I'm looking forward to seeing them, aren't you? If we ask for a show of hands tonight, I, I, would, I, would, I would imagine that there's probably not a person in this room that doesn't know someone on the other side. Not a person in this room who doesn't have someone that at one time filled a giant place in their life that is now crossed over and is in heaven awaiting our arrival. What a glorious thought. For some of you, it's a child. For some of you, it's a spouse. For others, it's a grandma or a grandpa, an aunt or an uncle, a brother or a sister. Maybe just a very, very close, near and dear friend. Oh, what a glorious thought. Heaven is wonderful because of who will be there. But can I say, number two, heaven is wonderful because of what is there. 
Just take your Bibles with me very quickly and go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. Truth of the matter is, if we didn't go any further, heaven would still be a wonderful place. Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are there, and so are our loved ones who have gone on before us. But the Bible tells us much more about heaven. Notice with me in verse number 15 of Revelation 21. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city, speaking of heaven, lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. I truly believe that John did his best to try to describe what he saw. But I also truly believe none of us can even begin to imagine how beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful a place. Those things that we, that we work our whole lives trying to accommodate, uh, to accumulate, I should say, in our lives. It's nothing but asphalt in heaven, gold. How about the precious stones and how about the crystal sea and, and, and how about the walls made of jasper all of these things that we would, we would give everything to try to accumulate in our life is, is merely building materials on the other side. Oh, heaven is an amazing place because of who is there. Heaven is an amazing place because of what is there. Streets of gold, gates of pearl, walls of jasper, crystal sea, many mansions. The list could go on and on. Can I say thirdly, heaven is a wonderful place because of what is not there. Would you look with me in Revelation 21? In verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Notice verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor cry. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Hey, I got good news for you. In heaven, no more little babies with cancer. Hey, in heaven, no funeral homes, no casket companies, no cemeteries. Nobody making headstones for graves because there will be no graves in heaven. Hey, I got news for you in heaven, no more doctors. No more hospitals, no more surgeries, no more pharmacists, no more need for medicine. Hey, in heaven at some point, no more crying. No more crime, no more sin, no more discouragement, no more depression. Why? Because the former things are all passed away. And Jesus says, come here, followers. I know your hearts are troubled but let's talk a little bit about the Father's house. Let me tell you about how wonderful it is. And maybe by thinking about heaven, you can encourage yourself in just a little bit. Oh, I'm looking forward to heaven. The subject of heaven, the Father's house, produces comfort in troubled hearts. But can I say, secondly, the Father's house is a place prepared for believers. Go with me back to John chapter 14, if you would. In verse number two, the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Not just anybody goes to the Father's house. Just like not just anybody is welcome in your house. Several years ago, I had a family member that was sitting in their home 
Actually, it was just two teenage young boys, cousins of mine, sitting in their home on a, on a nice evening. The front door was open. Uh, their, their parent was out, and they were, again, old enough to be home by themselves. And uh, there was a man in the neighborhood who, uh, who had, was struggling with dementia and Alzheimer's. And the man was out walking that night, and as they were sitting in the home, maybe watching some television, reading a book, all of a sudden the door opened and this man came walking in. Scared him absolutely to death. Who are you and what are you doing in our house? I don't know what the man said. Maybe he thought it was his house and perhaps he made to, made to go like he was going to sit down and, uh, and, uh, and to take a break for just a moment and they kind of had to forcibly say, you can't be here. We don't know who you are. This is not your home. This is our home. Well, I want you to know something. That your house is, in some respects, it's off limits to people who do not, well, who, not are part, who are not a part of your family. If I were to come to your home as, as your pastor, I would, I, I would come and I, I'm just never in the habit of just barging in. I wouldn't do that to you. I don't care how well I know you. I'll even go to my parents' house and I'll, I kind of start to open the door, but I'll knock real quick. It's their home. I don't live there anymore. You say, well, you're their son. I understand that, but just a, a rule of common courtesy. You just don't go barging in somebody's home. I make it a habit of making hospital visits. I always knock on the door. I announce my presence very loudly. Is it okay if I come in? Why? Because uninvited guests are unwelcome guests. And so we, we certainly understand that. I want you to know something. The Father's house is not just for anybody. The Father's house is a place prepared for believers. Notice, first of all, the audience Christ was speaking to. Who was he talking to that night? Was it a multitude? Was it thousands? No. The Bible indicates it was the upper room. By this point, just 11 disciples. Who were the disciples? They were followers of Christ. These men had put their own lives aside to follow Jesus with all of their heart. They had made personal sacrifice. They had believed in him. They had faith in him. They didn't understand all that he was and all that he was trying to accomplish, but these were his disciples. And I'm here to tell you that the Father's house is a place for the disciples of Christ, for believers, those that have a deeply committed faith and trust and relationship with him. Can I say that not only the audience Christ was speaking to in this passage, but let's consider the announcement of Christ to all mankind. In verse six, he says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Father's house is only accessible to those who come to the Father through the Son. Let me ask you this question tonight. Have you been born again? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ? Has the spotless blood of the Lamb of God been applied? Does it cover your sin tonight? Or are you trusting in your own goodness and your own works, trying to do enough to earn your way to heaven? I want you to know something. The Father's house is a place prepared for believers. It's prepared for men and women who will say, like Peter said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 16, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Apostle John reiterated that this was necessary in order to be born of, born, born of God in 1 John 5, 1. When he said this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. In order to be saved, you and I must come to the understanding and the realization that Jesus Christ is not just a Messiah, and not just the Messiah, but that he is my Messiah. He is my Savior. His blood was shed for me. Jesus stated in John 3, 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I want you to know something. You draw your last breath here on this earth, it will be too late to make a decision for Christ. We don't all just appear 
before the Apostle Peter in the heavens. We, we don't all have an opportunity to, you know, to say, well, here's why I should come in. No, listen, you're either going in or you're not going in. And you're going in, it's because you've placed all of your faith and all of your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone because heaven is a prepared place for believers. Jesus was talking to his disciples that night. Notice number three, and we'll be done. The Father's house provides eternal fellowship with the Savior. Notice verse number three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, ye may be also. You see the promise of Christ here in verse number three. The promise is this, that he is coming again. You say this promise was made 2,000 years ago. I don't care how long ago it was made. If it came from him, we can rest assured that it will come true. He has spoken it, and we can, uh, we can believe it with all of our hearts and all of our lives. At some point, at some time, the trumpet is going to sound, and Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he is going to receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. Imagine eternity with Jesus Christ forever and ever. Again, as we said a moment ago, there's a lot of wonderful things about heaven. But without a doubt, the best thing about heaven will be the Lamb of God. He is the only one celebrated in heaven. We often, we often talk about people that get to heaven, their songs that have been written, and, and I think I understand the, uh, the spirit in, in which they were written. But the truth of the matter is, Peter Folger is not going to be celebrated in heaven. And neither are you. There's only one person going to be celebrated in heaven. His name is Jesus. Any crowns that we earn, we don't earn them to, uh, to load them up on our head or to carry them around and show them off, put them in a trophy case. No, no. We earn crowns that we might cast them back at his feet because he is the only one who is worthy. You read Revelation 5, and you'll find that to be absolutely and totally true. We see the promise of Christ. I want you to notice finally the responsibility of believers. Look in verse number four. And whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. As someone who has had their eternal destiny settled and has developed a personal relationship with the God of the universe, I have a responsibility to tell others so that they too can go to the same place. It is a sin for me to keep quiet about heaven and about my Savior. It is a sin for me to be silent, for me to hoard it all to myself and not to tell other people, to not tell my neighbors, to not tell my coworkers, to not tell my family, to not tell my friends. It is a crime. It is a sin for me to keep silent because I know the way. He says to his disciples, he says, and the way ye know. You know how to get there. Tell somebody else about it. This is your responsibility. This is my responsibility. Will you join me in telling someone this week the way to heaven? Would you perhaps maybe commit that at the very least I'm going to take this booklet here and give it to somebody? It's a, it's a simple act. Some of you can do much more than that. You can take a Bible and you can sit down with a friend and you can walk them through the plan of salvation. You can witness to them. You can lead that soul to Christ. But everybody can do this. Everybody can take a track and give it out because, listen, that is our responsibility. Souls all around us are dying and going to a place of torment called hell. And yet we encourage ourselves and we love the thought of heaven. We've given a whole day to it. When we're down and discouraged and frustrated, we think about it. What a shame it would be for us to hide it, to hide our light under a bushel, to, to have the light that sits on the, the hill, the city, that yet we keep that light hidden. Oh, may God help us to bear our responsibility as believers, to develop a burden and to let people know, hey, listen, you don't have to go to hell. Jesus Christ has made it possible for every last one to enjoy heaven for all of eternity. My Father's house, it's a wonderful place. 
I'm going there, are you? I look across this room and I assume that the vast majority of you are. But have you told somebody else about it? When was the last time you, with a heart full of love and compassion, pointed someone to Jesus Christ and told them how they could be saved, how they could go to heaven, and how they could avoid spending eternity in hell? May God help us to bear this responsibility. Heaven, the Father's house, it produces comfort in troubled hearts. It is a prepared place for believers, and it provides eternal fellowship with our Savior.